not a good one. All right, I think we'll uh, just keep plowing away here and moving along with our, our program. Um, thanks again for, for coming and um, uh, joining us today. Uh, I don't think I introduced myself earlier. I am uh, Reed Kramer. I work as research director in our asset building program here at the New America uh, Foundation. And, and we're going to build on this discussion of um, public opinion, political culture, and political institutions to now uh, focus on uh, a, a question uh, that, that's fairly where, where the rubber uh, hits the road. And that question that's going to be the subject of this panel is what policies are, are possible in the next political era? And we're going to look into the future here. And, and I guess we can have varying uh, time horizons in our remarks. Um, uh, and of course, the way we consider what kind of era we're in might uh, matter in terms of what we think is possible. But we're going to look at really what might happen within the first term of the next uh, administration. Uh, you're going to hear uh, some remarks from me and uh, three of my distinguished colleagues here at the New America Foundation. Uh, David Gray is the director of the Work and Family Program here. Maya McGinnis runs our fiscal policy program and is also president of the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. And Len Nichols runs our health policy uh, program. And I'd like to start uh, the discussion by focusing on an area where I think uh, we will see uh, action in, in the near future uh, and potentially far-reaching action. And that's in the realm of uh, savings policy, particularly with respect to how it connects to economic security uh, issues. And I say this because I think there's a, a rising consensus that where we are now is just not uh, sustainable. Uh, the country's personal savings rate is at anemic levels. This is not a high profile economic uh, uh, figure and indicator, but it's one that tracks spending versus disposable income. And in 2005, it, it fell into negative territory for the first time in 40 years. Um, uh, it's, it's barely recovered into positive territory. It now hovers between 0 and 1 percent. And this is well below uh, historic uh, norms. This is a, uh, a macroeconomic figure that uh, is, in general, going to reflect the actions of a lot of high wealth, higher income people. But the economists are concerned because persistently low savings uh, does uh, uh, put upward pressure on interest rates. Uh, it curtails capital that's available for investment and generally is thought to undermine long-term economic growth. So it's a problem at the large scale at the macro level. At the, at the micro level, savings also matters uh, a great deal, as we can imagine. Families with low savings, low asset holdings, uh, are going to have a very limited ability to weather income fluctuations, unexpected events, uh, economic downturns. They're going to have a limited ability to make productive investments in their own uh, future. And even before the housing crisis uh, became apparent last year and there was uh, rising talk of, of, of recession, um, there was already a growing talk about uh, and, dis and discussion in policy circles around economic uh, insecurity issues. There remained some debate about what was driving this, whether it was uh, an increase in income volatility that was kind of a, a trend in how the economy was working, or whether it was really just linked to rising health care costs. Uh, others wanted to put uh, energy costs on the table as well. So these factors were all apparent uh, when we were having these discussions uh, in this very room a couple of years ago. But now with the downturn in the housing market, uh, rising foreclosures, rising defaults, I think it's pretty clear that a primary source of assets and savings uh, for many families has been eroded and uh, the problem of low savings has become more uh, pronounced. Uh, savings uh, and a healthy uh, asset balance sheet uh, is, is important for many uh, families. It's, it's just an essential component of economic uh, security. Uh, it's a way to move up and out of, the, uh, out of poverty and into the middle class. So we might expect that this is the kind of policies that we want uh, from our government to support this work um, and to facilitate this. And uh, I don't think it's an unreasonable expectation in America since we've had policies in the past that have done uh, similar type work. We've had historic initiatives like uh, the 19th Century Homestead Act. But in the 20th century, we also had uh, the creation of the Federal uh, Housing Administration in, 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 in the uh, New Deal era 
and uh, the GI Bill in the post-war era. All of these were very significant, large actions of government that expanded access to capital and promoted uh, savings and asset building in very real ways and, and produced uh, some meaningful uh, results. This contrasts with how we do things today, which is often by using the tax code to create tax incentives to get people to save or make deposits into uh, certain kinds of accounts, become and, and, uh, uh, and, and remain uh, homeowners. Um, in, in the current form, a lot of these tax expenditure programs are uh, poorly targeted, uh, they're often wasteful, and they're not very effective, I think, in, in achieving their, their, their goals. Um, a couple uh, weeks ago, when the White House released uh, the budget for this uh, coming year, there were uh, over $400 uh, billion dollars a year uh, in tax expenditures that were identified. Um, this included uh, $150 billion that went to homeowners. It included $120 billion a year that went to people that make deposits into retirement accounts. And the overwhelming majority of these tax benefits are going to flow to people that are, uh, have higher incomes and more assets, able to move money around to take advantage of, of, of the tax uh, benefits. And it leaves out the people with fewer uh, resources, lower incomes, and lower tax liabilities. So this is just the population that probably needs a boost and needs some additional support. And I think that one of the, the primary challenges of this next political era will be to significantly broaden asset uh, uh, ownership, broaden the base. And we're going to have to do it by creating better targeted uh, incentives, accessible savings opportunities, uh, institutional support structures that, that, that promote savings, as well as um, reinforce consumer uh, protections. It might be that we end up eliminating a lot of these tax expenditures that are on the books. Uh, when some of the Bush tax provisions expire in 2010 might be an opportunity where we, we look at uh, a window, we find a window for meaningful uh, tax reform. Um, but the extent to which policymakers end up seizing upon this opportunity is going to depend upon the degree to which they recognize that uh, the, the need for this inclusive savings uh, policy. And an inclusive savings policy would be one that targets lower and middle class Americans uh, and is also one that's lifelong. It looks at retirement needs, but it extends throughout the life course, uh, possibly beginning with children, covering working adults uh, as well. I think that uh, this policy can probably be done in ways that move beyond uh, past partisan debates. We've had the left's focus on opportunity and the right's focus on ownership, and together they might find some common cause around the issues of economic uh, security. Already we've seen some uh, policymakers that are willing to work across the aisle on these uh, issues. And I think to succeed, it's going to have to be done in a way that doesn't displace social insurance programs, but it's done, done in a way that uh, enhances it. So uh, my point uh, today is that I think in the coming years, we are going to see a basis for revisiting savings policy. Uh, I would say that the, 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 the form that it takes is going to be less clear. Uh, in the short run, we might see some immediate fixes on some low-cost uh, uh, efforts to increase financial education, provide more uh, consumer protections, look at ways of, of getting automatic uh, enrollment and, and kind of getting the, the defaults to work properly when people participate in savings plans. Um, in the long run, uh, we're probably going to have to look at how we incentivize these activities might want to use direct matches to deposits that go right into certain kinds of qualified uh, savings accounts. And I think that uh, there's a, a way to do it that would maybe require a lot of heavy lifting, but would be really uh, a visionary way to do it, which would be to construct a national savings plan structure. Uh, this kind of uh, approach has been called for in proposals that uh, uh, have, have looked to create universal 401k uh, proposals, and also ones that have uh, look to create children's savings accounts at birth. There's a l piece of legislation we've worked on called the Aspire Act that creates such a savings plan structure. Uh, it's not unprecedented. Uh, it would build on an expanded thrift savings plan model, which the federal government currently uses to uh, incentivize their employees to save for retirement. But the value of the approach is that it creates this institutional framework that can uh, get everybody into the system. It can keep costs low. It can provide the uh, consumer protections, and it can use the uh, uh, default mechanisms uh, advantageously. So uh, th this is a big uh, 
kind of proposal. There are obstacles in getting it passed. There are details to address that could be worked out. But the first step would certainly depend on policymakers uh, accepting the premise that savings and an inclusive asset building strategy uh, are a means to promote and support economic security. And that's actually a step that I think we're well on the way uh, to taking. So that's my view from the savings front about what kind of policies we might see some progress on in the near future. And I'm going to turn it over to David Gray to talk about work and family issues. Great. Thank you, Reed. Well, on the theory that there could be two potential moments of bipartisanship, it could go in two potential directions, one work looking at the big issues and taking on uh, entitlement reform, for instance. There's another theory, which would be that people are too entrenched around the big issues and that the bipartisan moment becomes a one around some of the out of the ordinary or under the radar issues. And the work and family area, family area in general, is one where you get some under the radar issues, which I think could surface in the next Congress. Uh, issues like um, foster care and child welfare, early childhood education, spending on kids more generally. But what I want to talk about today is one that I think probably everyone in the room uh, can relate to at some level, but we see bubbling up a little bit of public policy finally on, and that is the area of work-family imbalance. The increase of global, I see some nodding heads, globalization, wage flatlining, the two earner, uh, work, uh, earner couples, a lot of stress of how work and family life uh, interact or don't match has been something that most of us can relate to. But since the passage of the Family and Medical Leave Act in 1993, there hasn't been a lot of work done at the federal level in terms of public policy in this area, either in terms of short-term time off to help take care of a sick child, for instance, or more extended time off, like when someone has a child. But this is an area where all polls indicate there's overwhelming interest among the public in, in something on this area. 81% of American workers say that they're unhappy with their work-life balance. Two-thirds report feeling overworked. Nearly two-thirds of Americans say their job pressure interferes with their family life, and the same amount feel stressed on their job. You have large numbers of Americans saying that there's a problem there. And I think in the next Congress, if we look at the idea that people want to work together but may not be able to take on the bigger issues might be too entrenched. One area that will, will come to the, to the surface is an area like this one. Now, I think there are five reasons why, as we look at the climate, why you could see some action in the area of, of work-life balance. And as I talk about them, you'll see some of the areas where I think that action could take place. The first is if we just look at the presidential campaign. Clinton, Obama, Edwards all had detailed plans last fall in terms of workplace flexibility and work-life balance. State innovation funds, different kinds of paid leave, child care and telecommuting ideas, workplace flexibility generally. But in the private sector, tight labor markets are causing businesses to invest in retention and recruitment techniques of creating more flexible work arrangements for their workers. So I could see the McCain campaign, for instance, reacting to the, what's happening in the marketplace anyway and trying to come up with some innovative, low regulatory, high market driven incentives to further this kind of business move. So one could see a, a candidate McCain reacting to a democratic plan with his own plan in terms of workplace flexibility, putting on the agenda for the next Congress, whoever wins, this topic. Secondly, as often happens uh, when Washington doesn't act, the states are starting to take action in this area. Nothing happened for about 10 years, even at the state level, on workplace flexibility. At the county and, st and city level, uh, things did take place on work-life balance, where city ordinances tried to, to act. But in 2004, California passed a law in this area. Then Washington followed suit, and their law will take effect next year. Last June, the Assembly in New York acted. Last week, New Jersey acted. You're seeing more states starting to have action in the area of work-life balance. And often what happens is when states start taking action, when there's enough states starting to, to take uh, action, then the federal government follows suit. Third, the Bush administration has gotten involved in, in, in opening up this issue in two ways. One, uh, earlier this month, they proposed a notice of proposed rulemaking for new regulations for FMLA. First time that's been done in a while. They're responding to some Supreme Court and lower court decisions, but even raising the issue of FMLA through these regulations opens up this discussion a little bit more broadly. And secondly, 
the whole war is driving the administration to take a new look at work-life imbalance because the imbalance, the stress that military families are facing is very real. Anyone who has served or has friends who've served knows that these deployments are really creating real stress on family life. January 28th, the president signed an expansion of FMLA to cover military families for the first time. That's a significant move and has gotten the administration involved in work-life balance in a way that they have not been, through both the regs and the expansion towards veterans. Third, or fourth, the rise in self-employment is also going to help drive this trend and the increase in technology. 21 uh, million Americans plus are self-employed. Phil Longman and I like to talk about the return to the 18th century where more people are now going to start working and doing more things at home. Then things aren't going to revolve around uh, the, the, the workplace as much. Workplaces are going to start to transmit uh, data home and people are going to use technology to work remotely. We're already seeing that. We can all relate to that. That's another trend. You see bills in Congress from Republicans last term to increase incentives for telework has advantages for the environment, for transportation, for people with disabilities, for other areas. It really is an interesting uh, policy area, and I think it helps drive the, the, this issue to the forefront. And finally is the area of the working retired. You've got this massive baby boom generation that's going to start retiring, but they want to do it in a different way than people in the past have retired. They'd like to retire, but they'd like to continue working in some ways that will require some flexibility. So now when you have 78 million baby boomers getting ready to retire and they want to start working in a different way than they have before, and polls show, MetLife research in 2005 showed that the vast majority of them would like to continue working in some ways. You're going to see public policy start reacting to these older Americans who we all know vote and want to start having some flexibility in the workplace that's going to drive this kind of change. So it's going to be interesting to see how the baby boom retirement increases a new constituency for workplace flexibility. In the past, it used to be an issue, uh, used to be largely a women's issue, and that had a partisan tone to it occasionally. But now, the baby boom generation is going to, I think, broaden the partisan tone of work family issues in a significant way. And finally, the fiscal crisis that our country is in is also may necessitate this. That we talk about the idea that we're going to have a social security crisis premised on the fact that we're going to have very few workers and then all these retirees. But if these retirees are able to get some flexibility and can stay connected to the workforce, it also lessens the fiscal in crisis. And so this entitlement challenge that we're going to be dealing with in the next Congress is going to help drive some of these other changes in how the workplace evolves. So I think all these factors, when you put together, are going to mean that in a bipartisan world, whoever wins, some bargain could well be struck to help retirees and veterans for sure, to create some incentives for businesses, to help spur technology distribution, and to have some creative public policy in the area of workplace flexibility. Thank you. Hi, Maya McGinnis. Um, I run the fiscal policy program here, and I found myself so persuaded by my two colleagues' pitches. Um, I'm slightly discouraged that, for myself, as somebody who fundamentally believes that we need to find a new way to govern and work together, um, and also fundamentally believes that our kind of current adversarial model of politics does far more damage than it does good, um, it's, it's challenging to me that on the topics I work on, the budget and modernizing our tax system, I actually think we're still stuck in a period where these are very polarizing issues. And I doubt, as much as I think there needs to be a real model of bipartisanship and cooperation on leading on these issues, um, because they're so complex and they are not entirely easy, I don't think that they'll be the first issues that, that move a new model of governing. But I think some of the things we've just heard uh, really are likely to be. Why are the issues of budget and tax so complicated? I actually think there are a number of reasons that these are, these are some of the hardest to kind of pull out of the entrenched partisan ways. Um, one of them is that in our current environment where we have structural budget deficits and larger long-term challenges, they're not really that fun. Uh, most people in government would prefer to talk about cutting taxes or increasing spending. Um, and all of the issues on the table on the fiscal front are really quite the opposite. We need to find a way to update, modernize our tax system. Those are nice words to use, but also 
Also, we need to find a way to raise revenues, raise taxes, not something that politicians really uh, like to talk about quite as much. And as Cliff talked about on the first panel, while everybody is going to agree, do we need fundamental tax reform? Yes, we all do. Everybody nods. But that looks very different to everybody who's involved. So coalitions on fundamental tax reform tend to break down quickly. And there's generally a mistrust, a sense that whatever happens, it's already so complex, I won't really understand the changes, and I'll probably be worse off than I was before. Um, there's also lingering resentments on the issues um, in, in the fiscal policy world because there was, under the Clinton administration, a real emphasis on this issue and we had a deficit package with the working of a Democrat administration, a Republican Senate, Republican Congress all worked together on these issues. All the people who worked on those issues together kind of watched um, not happily as those deficits melt away, melted away and were replaced by large budget surplus, uh, excuse me, uh, the surpluses that they brought in melted away and they were replaced by large budget deficits. And now there's kind of the sense that taking the hard votes, working together on these issues is a thankless job. Um, and a lot of people are kind of worried about getting burned on doing that again. On taxes, um, taxes is really one of the defining differences in so many ways between the parties. If you talk about what makes Republicans and Democrats different, uh, you get all sorts of different answers. But one of them is fundamentally about the size of government. And so where should tax revenues be? Should they be at 15 percent of GDP, 18 percent of GDP, 22 percent, 25 percent? And that's kind of a, a, a line that people draw in the sand. So a lot of people don't want to cooperate on that issue because it tends to look as though they are giving up on their worldview of the way the, the world should look like. Um, and then finally, these are issues that are complex enough that they're not generally um, led through grassroots. You know, you don't hear a clamoring in the public to either uh, reform the way we do budgeting or change our budget priorities in a grand scale um, or fundamental tax reform in any way that's comprehensive. People will say they want to change taxes, but nobody will talk about how they want that to happen. So it means that these issues have to be led from the front, from the top, from politicians. And again, it's not an issue that really has a whole lot of thanks for those who do take leadership positions on it. In fact, most of them tend to lose their seats in, in the House or the Senate. So. Um, it's an issue that just kind of sits there and waits. Where do I think we'll go from here? Um, certainly it's not unlikely that we continue to muddle through in a partisan environment as we have had in the past. And what that leads to is nothing. Nobody wants to talk about the real choices that are involved in either fundamental tax reform with winners and losers or in balancing the budget in the short or the long term where they have to make tough choices. Um, we have seen some bipartisan efforts recently, uh, notably on the economic stimulus bill, which frankly sailed through Congress much more quickly than I ever thought it would, um, and on patching the AMT, which we have been doing one-year patches, but not paying for them. So I would point out that we've had bipartisan cooperation on the very things that are easy, um, on things that don't cost money or don't actually require hard choices, but allow, allow politicians to go back and say, see, we're doing something, but it's not exactly the heavy lifting. Where I do see um, a possibility for cooperation is in ways that we can almost redefine the way we do government and work on these policy issues. Right now, and I certainly think we feel this as a, as a think tank, whenever you develop a good new idea, you're almost worried about who's going to latch onto it first because as soon as one side takes it as their own, the other side automatically rejects it, even if they might have wanted it to be their own idea first. <laughs> so. There are a couple of different models that, that may work. One is kind of looking at reform more comprehensively. Another is redefining the ways we look at certain issues. Another is real just plain compromise, figuring out who cares about what the most and finding packages that combine both of those. Um, and finally is one that, that is actually serious, but letting government abdicate its responsibilities in some places. So just an example on each of them. In terms of comprehensive, again, the issues that I'm talking about and these big fiscal policy issues are big enough that our normal tendency toward incrementalism would probably not be appropriate. We're going to need to think about, as we have all these different things coming together, the retirement of the baby boomers, the expiration of the tax cuts, a recognition, recon, recognizing that our tax system is built for a previous century where globalization and a new financial world calls for new taxes. As these things all come together, it may be most beneficial to do something that's either modeled like the 1990 Budget Summit or many of the commissions we've had before, where we start with every single thing on the table. We have an incredibly lofty goal. <coughs> we bring together a lot of members of Congress who uh, haven't worked together on much recently and don't, you know, may still be polarized. But you can pull together a package with enough moving pieces that everybody in the end is able to basically say, 
It's sure not the package I would have wanted. You know, there are a lot of things in here I don't like, but overall it's good enough that I can lend the support to it. And so I think that this kind of a commission model and really throwing every single issue you can think of may actually ease some of the necessary negotiations on this. Um, a second approach would be redefining some of the issues that we talk about. So one example, just to talk about Social Security a little, uh, to generalize, oftentimes you'll find that on the left, Democrats want to lift the payroll tax cap to help fix the Social Security problem. On the right, Republicans want to cut benefits. There's actually um, something where if you tax Social Security benefits, you can label it as either one. There are different ways to redefine a lot of the policies that we're doing that could lend themselves to both sides saying, we won, um, and it would actually be the same policy. Another kind of example, Reed was talking about tax expenditures, which is something we focus on a lot here. Tax expenditures are really, for the most part, um, $800 billion <laughs> worth of government spending funneled through the tax code. As a result, it's very, it's very desirable to create policies that are tax expenditures because you can say, look, I'm helping housing or education or children and cutting taxes at the same time. But when you want to go look to reform those things, it has the unfortunate reverse label where any change means you're quote unquote raising taxes. When really it's more appropriately labeled to be scaling back on spending, which is generally something politicians are more eager to say they're doing. If we um, this is really kind of a dry recommendation, but if we redefine a lot of the areas of our budget and go back to a, a, something we did in the 1960s, looking at budget concepts, how we do accounting, how we label our budgets, we can actually change a lot of things so that the definitions would be more favorable for the same kinds of policies. That would allow things that look uh, are described in a more favorable light, I think would be helpful. Um, in terms of compromises on tax policy, for instance, I do think that there are areas where both kind of the left and the right have a lot of good points on tax policy that could be brought together. If you say that the right focuses more on tax efficiency, how to have a tax policy or a tax regime that's good for the economy, and the left cares more about kind of tax fairness or how progressive should a tax code be, particularly in a time of growing income inequality, it is not impossible to combine those two goals. One of the policies we've talked about here is a progressive consumption tax, which would shift the tax base that we have now away to a different tax base that would in all likelihood be positive for the economy, but in so doing also change the tax rates, making the tax system more progressive than it currently is. To me, there are, there are a number of examples of potential kind of win-wins that may look like that. Other ways that we could reform the tax code not have to actually increase tax rates uh, but would ultimately lead to higher tax revenues as a share of GDP. That may get around this kind of huge uh, sticking point we have that there's so many people committed to not raising taxes, even though it's quite clear revenues are going to have to grow at some point. Just finally, in terms of uh, Congress maybe choosing not to do any of this, there are ways to build into the budget different automatic changes that could fix some of the problems that we're dealing with. So there are kinds of things like budget triggers. We know one, one policy that I think makes a whole lot of sense, but pretty much every politician promises not to do it, is to talk about changing the retirement age or talk, talk about what we just heard about, how to help people stay in the workforce longer, qualify for benefits at a later point in life. Um, moving some of these things into an automatic part of the budget would be a good way for Congress to say, um, you know, well, I can't really help it. We built this trigger in. This is an action forcing event. And these things would happen automatically unless Congress chooses to make changes on their own. Changing the defaults is one of the ways we're encouraging savings in this country. Changing the defaults in the budget may actually be one of the ways we start encouraging proactive actions. So to conclude, um, there are a lot of things that work against really these issues moving forward in the immediate future. There is no mandate coming out of the presidential election to work on these issues. Tax reform is not even on the top of the agenda. Tax cuts, actually on both sides are, but not tax reform. Um, and without a mandate, it's going to be hard to move these issues forward. Um, on the other hand, they're kind of unavoidable. They're here. We have structural budget deficits. The baby boomers start to retire this year. The AMT is there every single year. It's a real thorn in Congress's side because they don't know how to pack, pack shit on an annual basis. And the tax cuts are about to expire at the end of the decade. These are a lot of things that are going to push us to have to come to some kind of changes. So I think the model, the scenario that I see most likely is that we build some social political capital between the two parties in working together on a lot of the other issues that could lend themselves to grand bargains. Um, everything from maintaining a commitment to trade but also increasing our commitment to helping people who are not, there are winners and losers in trade, helping the people who are, are losers throughout that transition. That's something I could see both sides working on. Something Len may well talk about, but kind of in healthcare, there are lots of grand bargains that um, I think are likely to move more quickly. And if through those kinds of efforts, we build 
more capital, more trust, which is something there is very little of in Congress right now. I think that's what lays the foundation to uh, move forward on some of the fundamental issues that, that are all throughout fiscal policy questions. Thank you. Well, uh, my name is Lynn Nichols, and I do health policy for a living, and I feel compelled to remind us of the title of this session, What Policies Are Possible in the Next Political Era? You know, sometimes when I think about comprehensive health reform, I think it is kind of like pushing a square boulder up a hill, which is why my beard is gray and my legs are sometimes weak. But at the same time, I, I, th I think I should tell you why I think we're having this conversation now, why I'm actually somewhat optimistic. I did live through 93, 94 and have lots of scar tissue. I'd be glad to show you in a bar someday. But it is, it is indeed, uh, some signals are good. I want to talk a little bit about some new math that actually makes it possible. And then some brief contours of what the policy might actually look like. The simple question as to why we're having this conversation now, and you can look back over, you know, you can go to a Health Policy 101 lecture 35 years ago, 30 years ago, 25 years ago, look at the textbooks through time. The problems are always the same cost, access, and quality. The fraction of the population that's uninsured is actually remarkably constant. It bounces between 15 and 17. It just doesn't move that much. So why suddenly are we talking about it again? Why do we talk about it 16 years ago? Fundamentally, the reason we're talking about it today is because there's a growing perception that the cost of doing nothing is very high. In 1991, the run-up to the election then, people were worried about affording health care for their own family budgets because of a recession. Once a recession went away, you can track this quite depressingly through the polls, support for the Clinton effort declined. Today, people are afraid of affordability of health care because cost is so high and it's there and it's not going away. The current recession we may very well be in merely turbocharges that fear. It doesn't put it there. And because it's permanent now, 80% of workers respond. They think health insurance is going to be unaffordable to them, even though they have it now, within five years. So that real fear is precisely why the politicians are reflecting, OK, we've got to address affordability. But the twin reason we're talking about it now is because of employers. You might have heard this rumor. If you've been watching the Ohio discussions, you know there was life before NAFTA. International competition is much more important today. Many firms used to be able to just push health care cost growth that exceeded everything else forward into prices. China and India make that impossible. And in the short run, they can't push it back into wages. They can maybe in the long run. We can argue about economic theory and religion. But in the short run, they cannot push it back into wages so that it's got to come out of something. If you can't push it into prices, you can't push it into wages. It's coming out of profits, which is exactly why so many employers are hyper-focused on trying to structure a bipartisan conversation, which is why so many of them look at the world similarly to me. And I think it's, it's in, instructive to look at the proposals coming out of the trade associations. I particularly commend you to the ERISA Industry Committee. Mark Ugaretz just walked in in the back. The ERISA Industry Committee is a group of very large employers, very savvy buyers, and their proposal for reforming the healthcare system is strikingly similar to my own. Therefore, it's brilliant, but aside from that, <laughs> It reflects a reality-based view of how we can move forward and, and buy smart. So all that is, is going on. Third, system stress. Talk to anybody who runs an emergency room, and you will learn that in most major cities in this country, roughly 25% of ambulances are diverted to some other hospital because the hospital's full. The middle class is starting to notice there are consequences of access to care from having a system that is so overstressed with the uninsured. And certainly cost is the main reason, it's the main linkage among the problems, but it's an awareness of the linkages between cost, access, and quality that make us more willing to consider um, common solutions. Then you look at the candidates, okay? And you see on the Democratic side, I mean, it's striking compared to past campaigns, how much focus there is on cost. Just whatever else you may think about the campaign, look at the way Senator Clinton unveiled her proposals in three parts. The first part was cost. The second part was quality. The third part, the third part was coverage. Senator Obama's plan, Senator Edwards' plan, all have at least as much detail on the cost growth side as they do on the coverage side. This is recognition of a very serious linkage between cost and coverage in the long run. On the Republican side, Huckabee's the first Republican in my lifetime 
who has ever looked at supply side incentives. He says we've got to have transparency, we've got to have accountability from physicians, we've got to pay for performance. These are words the American Medical Association does not love. This is evidence of still latent maverick tendencies in the man, I support that, but I would also say it is a reflection of the fact that we have to both deal with cost and coverage at the same time if we're going to move forward. Huckabee, if Huckabee was given this talk 40 years ago, he, he would say, if we were having this meeting 40 years ago, half of you would be smoking and the other half wouldn't care. And he's right. And the point about that is that we can change the way we think about healthcare behavior. We can change the way we think about our own behavior. And I submit to you, regardless of who wins, he should be Secretary of HHS because we need him to make these, these, these sermons about this stuff. We'll get other people in charge of evolution. Don't worry. We'll, we'll tell you about that. Okay. Then, oh, let me tell you why I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic because of what's going on on the Hill. In 92, in the run-up to 93, there were a number of people starting to think about, well, we might be going to have a conversation about health reform, but it never really got to a real bipartisan discussion. You already have on the Hill three different legislative vehicles that are designed to create this, uh, this momentum, and I submit to you the most interesting one is Wyden Bennett, which Ezra Klein has written about quite well recently. But I will tell you, what's really going on here is a recognition, far broader than us, although of course it was our idea, but it's far broader than us, about how if you're going to do health reform, you've got to do it on a bipartisan basis. And to make it bipartisan, what's got to be true is that both parties' values have to be reflected in the outcome, as you've heard a fair bit of that today. Now, how do you do that in healthcare? Well, first, you've got to cover everybody and you've got to take care of the vulnerable for the Democrats, okay? But on the Republican side, you've got to have markets and choice and serious budget constraints be part of the solution. Well, that is exactly what Senators Wyden and Senators Bennett, and by the way, Senator Grassley from Iowa and Alexander from Tennessee and Greg from New Hampshire have agreed to try to do. Now, they're not, this is not the perfect bill, Lord knows, but it is a perfect place to have a conversation about a ha how to move forward in this bipartisan way. And here's the new math. 60 is beginning to be increasingly clear to actually equal 70. And by that I mean it's going to take 60 votes. You might have heard this rumor. It takes 60 votes to get something through the Senate. But 60 means 70 senators have to believe the fundamental policy proposal is acceptable. Otherwise, you will never get the 60 votes. This cannot be however many Democrats win plus pick one, Norm Coleman, Olympia Snow, whatever. It's got to be into the middle of the, of the Republican Party, and that's precisely why Greg's participation and Bennett's participation and Alexander's participation and Grassley's participation right now in this conversation getting us up to this point is so, is so important. So how might this thing play out? Well. I think it's fair to say what's very interesting, again, if you look at the proposals coming out of the trade associations, look at the Democratic Party's modal proposal, and what you see in Massachusetts and California, what you see is, first, you've got to make a market that works for everybody. So we can argue about the details of that, but it means you've got to have fair rules about how to sell insurance. You've got to have subsidies for the low-income population so they can play, too. Right? And you've got to have some kind of organizing structure that makes sure everybody's in there. And then you've got to have a structure that enables you to buy health care smarter. You know, my colleague Shannon Brownlee just published a book that's getting a lot of attention about overtreated as a title. And it's about how much we do in health care, Lord knows with good intentions, that ends up not adding a whole lot to value, but adding a whole lot to cost. We've got to learn to buy smarter, and I submit to you that buying smarter is the key to all of this. Buying smarter is the key to Medicare reform. Maya will talk about quite eloquently the fiscal stresses we face because of our entitlement structures. But I submit to you, and I think she agrees, and I think a lot of people agree, the fundamental driver of that is health care cost. You can't solve the health care cost problem in Medicare without solving the health care cost problem in the system. Because you might have heard this rumor, Medicare is in the system. Okay? So you've got to do it simultaneously. Well, buying smarter is what that's about. How do you get the consensus to buy smarter unless you get every American in the tent? There's got to be fundamentally a linkage between personal responsibility to acquire health insurance and take care of your own behavior and eat your broccoli and do your sit-ups and acquire insurance 
and social responsibility to make markets work and to buy smarter so we can afford it for all of us going forward. With that kumbaya moment, I say to you it's possible. <laughs> Thank you, Len. I, I definitely enjoy hearing my colleagues speak, but um, let's open it up for some uh, questions from the uh, floor. Yes, and then join. Question for Maya. I attended one of the fiscal wake-up tour uh, shows up in Hartford, Connecticut, and it scared me uh, well, <laughs> as it's intended to, and I know you support the general message. Um, um, I'm terrified about my own health insurance. I'm ready to support pretty radical government measures to do something about it but I'm also very conscious of the cost. Can we afford, as a country, to introduce some big new health care reform, comprehensive reform? And I also assume that any budget estimate we get, the true number that we actually spend will be double the number that they tell us, because it always works that way. I mean, so, you know, can we really afford this? or? Or, or is it necessary for us to sort of face and fix some of our other fiscal problems and health care reform is the dessert? Yeah, I think that's a good question, and I assume Len will have many comments on that as well. I mean, there, there's no question that once you've kind of had the whole picture of the long-term projections laid out for you, nobody can come away from that. Um, and, and a lot of this is led by Dave Walker when he was the head of GAO, kind of painting the picture. Nobody comes away saying, wow, well, we've got extra money to throw away, right? The budget is a real, real challenge growing to be a greater challenge every decade, and clearly we need to get started on that sooner rather than later. I think that's probably, from my perspective, why health care is one of the most obvious areas where a grand bargain needs to, probably will, and it must happen for this to be um, practical. Nobody would say, well, I would think nobody would have said what we should do is create a huge new health care entitlement without thinking of how to pay for it or without planning on ways to control costs. Um, I would have said that before we passed prescription drugs, I would have been wrong. But I think that that's, it's a very different environment right now. I think that everybody who's talking about the need to expand coverage is talking about that clearly as linked, this is what Len was saying, um, to controlling costs. And in fact, that's being emphasized by a lot of the people who are out there in combining those two things. Um, I. I I basically would echo what Len says, that this is something where fiscal and health care are so interrelated that no matter what, we're not going to be able to get a handle on the fiscal challenge, which is driven by health care costs and demographics, <laughs> without looking at the health care industry throughout the whole economy. And in order to do that, there are so many moving pieces. If you look at what the Congressional Budget Office is putting out right now, um, there are so many pieces on the different areas of health care, from kind of the delivery mechanisms to insurance to how we control man disease management, all these different pieces, there are cost savings to be had. And I think pretty much everybody who's seriously moving this issue forward says that, because of the fiscal reality, has to be part of the grand bargain that would include coverage. But I think Len should speak to that. I, I agree with all that. And I would say the first question to ask yourself is, can we afford not to? Why are the business leaders calling for some kind of serious reform that I talked about? It is because they see the trajectories of unchecked cost, and they see their own bottom lines evaporating. Even Walmart, the most successful corporation arguably in our lifetime, big company, <coughs> lots of growth, very small margins. And those margins, are those margins are threatened by this trajectory. So what I'm trying to suggest is, the way to get at that cost trajectory is to do comprehensive reform. In the absence of that, you can't do it. Now, do you have to do coverage expansion along with it? Well, that's a good question. And I think it's a serious question, a question we're going to grapple with as we go forward. But what's interesting to me is to think about one of the real keys to getting the health care cost trajectory, if you will, under control is an information infrastructure. It's kind of hard to have an information whereby we can make sure each clinician, patient encounter, has appropriate information about the patient and the disease at the point of service, okay? That's a prerequisite to getting quality and cost all in line. How do you have an information system that works if you've got 90 million people becoming uninsured over a two-year period? How do you have that work unless you've got the system including Doesn't everyone? Doesn't that conflate the cost to the economy and the cost to the federal budget? If I'm Walmart, I could see supporting a plan that is essentially funded by taxpayers. It, you know, mostly, or at least the, the, you know, the math is part of the federal budget, and to some extent it's off of my back, and that's the reason business is going to support it to some extent. So that, that doesn't relieve the federal government budget uh, 
on that. Which is exactly why the Wyden-Bennett approach is so intriguing in my view. And that's why I think Judd Gregg signed on to it. Because what it does is it takes the existing $180 billion we spend through a tax expenditure by exempting uh, income, in, individual income liability from what an employer pays on your behalf, take that away, turn it into a progressive tax, sliding scale tax credit, and you use existing money to finance the coverage expansion even while putting in place some of these cost containment activities. And that's how you get a bipartisan agreement. There's got to be a budget constraint. I'm with you, friend. But we are spending enough money. We can just shuffle it around. Julie? Is it inevitable that bipartisanship is the avenue toward workable policies? I mean, the counter-argument is we need stronger partisanship under unified government to put through new ideas, whether micro ideas or big ideas on the budget. Uh, and, and, and so I'm curious about that. And related, isn't the primary the other way to think about it? That's what voters want. It's not that they're independent, these two guys. It's that they have clarity of ideas. It's, the, it's actually the compromises people are rejecting. Uh, I mean, that's the other way to see why Mitt Romney and Hillary Clinton are not doing so well. So, I mean, is there a, a way to think of partisanship as the avenue of strong partisanship, the budget reform, health care reform, uh, and maybe we're asking the wrong question to start with? We just want, if one comment on that, I would just say that the rhetoric of Barack Obama and the reality of John McCain in terms of how he's reached across and, and, and co-sponsoring legislation plays to the opposite of that. That the people, the parties, have in fact, at the end of the day, nominated the two people who've shown the most likelihood to be to reach across. I would say I actually, I actually believe it fundamentally de depends on the issue. So I could see mm. for taxes, um, mm. you could see strong Democrat Party or strong Republican Party both pushing through what would be very different tax regimes and both would have some, some pluses and some minuses and it would be really interesting to see what would happen. And not being a compromise, it would actually probably be more reflective of a worldview and somewhat internally consistent. On the other things I would talk about though, on budget, on issues that are really hard to do, where they have a lot of losers, no party wants to make that their issue. I mean, really, bipartisanship is the, the cover, you CYA policy. You know, make sure that you're not the guy who's going to lose because you took the lead on a tough issue. So I think for things that are desirable and voters want to see, by all means, stronger parties might actually be, be the better tool to do that. But by th things that we know need to happen, but you might not really want it to be your party's main message, it's absolutely critical. Okay. You have to speak up so we can hear you up here. My name is Mike Holtzman. Uh, you, you, you mentioned that you thought it wasn't tension for behind uh, some of the cost increases that you see in their care, basically uh, testing and, and proceeding with these of the greatest cost. And I, I think you want to, I think you want us to believe that these, the numbers of tests and the procedures that are performed, whether they bring out. Right. Um, I was trying to be charitable toward my fellow human beings. I mean, I, I think it is true that uh, the incentives we have in place today are certainly in favor of doing too much care uh, on the margin. I would, I would take your point, absolutely. In fact, almost all the reforms we work at are, are trying to, to, to realign those incentives with a social interest in uh, what I would call stewardship of resources. But I would also say when you, when you deal with real clinicians and get down on the margin, you say, okay, look, in Florida, we see uh, maybe 12 times as many admissions in the last six months of life as you see in Minnesota. It is true there are some people in Florida who uh, view the uh, medical degree as an ATM, but it's also true that a lot of them are really looking at the patients on the margin and they're saying, you know, mine needs to go in. So I think there is a lot of gray area. It's not, turns out, it's art. It's not all science. In fact, it's stunningly art and not science. And so there is a lot of discretion. What I'm trying to suggest is a world in which we realign incentives so that discretion has a higher bar to climb over before we overuse resources on a systematic basis. That's really where I'm headed. 
Yes, in the back. <coughs> Well, Bob, that's a great question, and I uh, commend you to come to our meeting uh, next Friday where we'll do this on the Hill. But uh, the short uh, answer would be remember, as you know quite well, because I know we spoke and you covered this very closely, um, California is unique in a, in a number of ways. Uh, number one, it had, especially compared to Massachusetts, it had twice as many uninsured as Massachusetts, 20% of the population versus 10 so the hill to climb was much higher. Second, Massachusetts had an uncompensated care pool already financed that covered 85% of the cost of the uninsured through their charity care system. So really they were topping off a latte versus uh, raising a bunch of new money. So California had a much bigger budget problem. Third, uh, with all due respect, you could put all the illegal immigrants in Massachusetts in my car compared to uh, California. And in fact, this gentleman uh, in earlier raised the point, immigration is a huge issue. It was a huge subtext issue in California, and it's absolutely bipartisan. Uh, to keep them out of the system. The governor proposed covering uh, all uh, children regardless of immigration status, and, is, and the Democrats oppose it. So fundamentally, uh, it is a very uh, tough nut to crack. Fourth, in California, as you know, Bob, the uh, Republicans in the legislature refuse to raise revenue no matter what. Well, you can't cover six million uninsured citizens without doing something on revenue. So that forces a kind of budgetary legger domain, which led to the need to, quote, go to the people, unquote, to raise the revenue through a tobacco tax. And fifth, you've got a very, very, very strong and active uh, single payer lobby in California that is, I, I would submit, um, shall we say, vigorous compared to uh, the rest of the country. Uh, you know, sort of the power wanes as you come toward the Mississippi. And so out there, they were adamantly opposed. And that had the effect, unfortunately, on the, on the ground of splitting the left. So you had left opposed, right opposed, a big budget problem. Frankly, it's stunning they got as close as they did. And I would submit there are a lot of tactical things you can argue about this or that, you know, and Parada's ego and so forth. But it all comes down to the hill was very high, and what it suggests is, first, there was a bipartisan agreement between the governor and the assembly speaker. There was a, a broad coalition that supported the final deal, including business sector, as well as hospitals, as well as insurers, which is stunning compared to the 93-94 experience in Washington. But there was not enough to get over that very high hill to climb, which suggests you need federal reform, not individual states with, with situations that complex on the ground. But come next Friday, and you'll hear a lot more views besides mine. Next Friday, uh, noon. Joanne, do you remember? I think it's noon to 2. Uh, it'll, it'll, yeah, it'll, we'll, noon to 2. Okay, thanks, Elizabeth. And Dirksen, where is it? Hart, 902. Hart, very good. <laughs> Much will be served. Just, just ask Elizabeth. She knows everything. I just work here. Yeah. Um, one more question from the audience? Sure. My, my little socialist question here. <laughs> it seems so simple in Europe. They just, the, the taxpayers pay for the universal health care. Even in Britain, they, the, the most market free people. <coughs> They don't you touch our health care system. We want to pay for it. Why can't the Democrats just bite the bullet and say, everybody's taxes go up 100 bucks um, a year, and we're going to get universal health care, and, <laughs> and employers don't have to pay for it? Or, what, it seems so simple. What is our problem? <laughs> well, my friend, perhaps it's too simple for us. Oh, I, I, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I would suggest 100 bucks is just a little bit optimistic about yeah. what it would cost. But I, I, I would also say, they like each other better over there. <laughs> they, ha they have more solidarity, I mean, really, in, in a fundamental uh, and profound sense. But I, I would submit to you, here's the deal. It's rough over there, too. Every single country is trying really hard to figure out how to get that cost curve under control. It is unambiguously true. Our costs are way higher. And we have had periods of rapid growth compared to them. But if you look over a 30-year period, you know, the rates of growth are kind of similar. It's just we got this really stupidly high level because we do all these, all these silly things about incentives. So I would submit to you, we believe in individualism far deeper than they do. So it cannot be exactly their system. However, 
trust me, we can learn a lot from them. And a lot of good people on both sides of the aisle are looking at the Netherlands right now, Switzerland. There's some good stuff coming out of England, actually. The Germans, the French. There's a lot of stuff going on that we're going to take and, and try to build. But it's got to be an American system where the individual choice is at the core of it, and then we try to make it work around those edges. Taxpayers will definitely have their part to play in the shared responsibility, no question about that. All right. All right, I think we're going to transition here to the final uh, panel today, but uh, thanks all the uh, panelists and for your uh, comments. Um,